junior lawyers who've come in such large numbers that you have truly left me humbled. My own family. But last not the least, all the former judges, both of the Supreme Court, I can see Indiradi in the audience, of the Allahabad High Court who have come here. My dear friend Pradeep Bagel is here in the audience. Thank you so much for such a great honor. What more can I expect <laughs> from life? I'll begin with a little story about flowers, because I was thinking that the second bouquet was for Brother Sanjeev, and when the second bouquet came for me, and then there were two bouquets for Brother Sanjeev as well. When I became Chief Justice of the Allahabad High Court, on an average, at every bar functions, there would be about 25 to 30 marigold garlands which were placed on your collar. And of course, when I went home, Kalpana would say that, uh, you know, these marigold flowers tend to damage uh, your, your shirt, and then it's very difficult to get the color off. So I began by telling the president of the bar association, I said, yeah, aap fool dene ka kash na karein. Kitna paisa kharch karte aap. So he said, nahi ji, aisa nahi hai, ab itna pyaar hai, sabhi ka pyaar hai. Then I said, but kash aap na lehen, itne fool dene ka. At which point of time he told me the eternal truth. And he said, yeah, fool aap ke liye nahi dete hai, chief sabhi humare liye dete hai. Thoda sa photo photo bhi ho jata hai aapke saath. But such me, aaj jo fool mile hai mujhe, ye mein dil se mujhe pata chala ki ye fool mere liye the. Kyunki dil ki baatein jo chupai nahi ja sakti. Well, it's a moment today of thanksgiving. It's a little bit of time for looking back in time. But before that, I would like to thank from the bottom of my heart the Supreme Court Bar Association for organizing this event and for all the beautiful words which have been said by each one of the speakers who preceded me. Brother Sanjeev Khanna, I mean, I'm really touched to the core by what you've said. Thank you so much, Rachna. Thank you, Kapilji, for these beautiful words in the poem. Thank you so much, A.G., and thank you really all of you for giving me this great honor together with my family. I don't want to be very long, but it's obviously a time when I must acknowledge those who have played a very critical role in my life, and who more or who better to begin with than my own mother. I was a sick child. I was prone to falling sick. My mother must have spent night after night keeping awake to ensure that I get well. And I still remember a little saying or a shloka, whatever you can call it, that she would say, which I was thinking of over the last few days. I must have heard her innumerable times saying, Aushadi Janavi Toyam Vaidyo Narayano Hari, which meant that Aushad, medicine, is like the Ganges. And Vaidyo Narayano Hari, the doctor, is in the position of Narayan. I never knew what the meaning of that phrase was. I never did. All that I knew was that it was accompanied by the bitter medicine which went into my mouth. She told me when I was born, I was growing up, that I've named you Dhananjay, but the dhan in your Dhananjay is not material wealth. I want you to acquire knowledge. <laughs> like, most, like most Maharashtrian women, she was a very powerful. Ours was a woman-dominated house. My mother dominated everything at home. And I think women from Uriya are in the same pattern. So my... <laughs> My lovely spouse, Kalpana, takes, calls all the shots at home, but never messes around with the judgments. <laughs> we had a household help when I was young. 
Her name was Bhima Bai Bhanu Ghamat. She came from rural Maharashtra, coastal Maharashtra. She was engaged because my mother had contracted typhoid, and she was con she was engaged to be with my mother to give a nursing nursing care for her. And when I was born, I was a late born child, but not fondled. I was disciplined, but not overly disciplined. I was allowed to live my own childhood without really compelling me to live the dream of my parents. They never let, they never tried to live their dreams through me. But Bhima Bhai Ghanu, Bhanu Ghamat was completely illiterate. In fact, she learned how to write her name when she joined our family, our household. I was so sick, but she really nurtured me. And she taught me so much about life beyond the urban area that I was born into. From her, I realized the truth about our rural households, rural Maharashtra. Most importantly, she made sure that though my father had become a judge just about a year before, a year after I was born, that I associated with people, with young friends, who belonged to the margins of our society. My best friend always wore two pairs of shorts. And the reason why he wore two pairs of shorts was not because he had too many, but because he wanted to hide the holes in his shorts. Years later, I read a judgment of the Supreme Court. Actually, it was penned by my father about this person who was sentenced to death. And everybody, everybody who gave evidence in that case said that he was such a despicable man. He didn't even have, he would wear shorts with many holes. But I remembered that story when I was reading that judgment. In so many which ways it reflected the true character of India, at least when I was growing up. But I learned so much from her, and there's rarely a day of my life when I think both my sister and I don't remember her. I'll say just a few words about my father, who was a mentor, a good friend, a dear friend to me. He taught at the government law college, and so many of the great doyans of the bar, Pali Nariman, Soli Sorabji, Anil Divan, Ashok Desai, all of them were his students. He was very disciplined, but he didn't discipline us as children. He thought that we should learn the ideals of discipline looking at the way he led a disciplined life. Two things which I'd like to share with you, otherwise I can go on forever about a parent, as all of us can. He bought this small house in, a small flat in Pune. And I asked him, why on earth are you buying a flat in Pune? When are you going to go and stay there? He told me one thing. He said, I know I'm never going to stay there. But he said, I'm not sure how long I will be with you. But do one thing. Keep this flat until the last day of your tenure as a judge. And I said, why is that? So he says, if you feel that your moral integrity or your intellectual integrity is ever compromised, I want you to know that you have a roof over your head. Never allow, <laughs> never allow, never allow yourself to be compromised either as a lawyer or as a judge because you have no place of your own. When I was young and I was growing up and I was in Delhi University, everyone took to, you had to do a subsidiary subject and he, all my friends were taking either philosophy most of them were taking philosophy, which was a subject where you read for one evening and passed. You had to only pass. But my father insisted that I should take up Hindi. Now, I knew only Bambaya Hindi. But he insisted that I took Hindi, and it was a difficult call. But in the course of learning Hindi in college, I came across Mahadevi Verma, Jai Shankar Tripathi, Nirala, Ramdhari Singh Dinkar, and so many, Munshi Premchand, Gaban I must have read at least a dozen times, just I read Cry the Beloved Country by Alan Payton later, which really inspired me. So he inspired me to do Hindi. Almost 
30 years later, when I was to go to the Allahabad High Court, I realized how important it was because very often <laughs> the advocacy in English would end with, please your lordship. And then lawyers would accept me so much better because they realized the frailties of my tongue, of my language. But they felt that I had reached out to them in a language which was close to their heart. And that's one of the lessons which I learned of trying to reach out to people in areas which make a difference to their lives. So the last 24 years of being a judge have been filled with challenges. They've been filled with triumphs. They have been filled with personal tragedies. They have been filled with unlimited personal happiness. But as a judge, what is it that really makes you tick? I'll just tell you a few incidents which have really made me tick in the last so many months. Yes, you write judgments which make a difference to the nation. You write important judgments on constitutional law. And we've got this complexity of law before us now, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, the Electricity Act, the Competition Act. You just name it and you have new and complex areas of law coming up before us. But truly, what makes us stick as judges is the impact which we have on the lives of common citizens. Just yesterday, last week, Brother Pardiwalai, Brother Mishra and I had passed an order allowing for two visually challenged candidates to appear at the interview of the Rajasthan Judicial Service Examination. They were ousted on the ground that they were disabled and they didn't meet the benchmark disability requirement. After they appeared for the interview, we were told that they have qualified and they are in the select list. <laughs> That's what makes us stick. Two weeks back, an aspiring doctor with myopathy of the lower limbs was told that his disability is more than 88%. And therefore, he was told that he cannot become a doctor. But he had scored so well in the NEET undergraduate examination. Two medical boards said that he is not worthy of becoming a doctor because his disability is very high, but his, brilliant, his mind was brilliant. We got him examined by a third medical board and then passed an interim order that that student must be enrolled to the MBBS this year. And I'm sure that the student will do well. Or what about this student from the IIT Mumbai who was admitted to the IIT Mumbai, a child of a daily wager, who was not able to gain admission for the reason that the fee, of, of the, the fee which he had to pay or the documents which he, had to, uh, to, which he had to upload could not be uploaded within time. We said that he must be given admission. Or a Dalit student who was admitted to the IIT Dhanbad but couldn't conjure up 17,500 rupees to gain admission to IIT Dhanbad. His sister had given him a credit card but he was not able to operate the credit card. But we gave him admission. What about, we are talking about now, I don't know their names, but I'll give you one more name which all of you know, about Sara Suni, one of the members of your bar, who is both, she suffers from a hearing and a speech impairment, but who needed a sign language interpreter. And we gave her a sign language interpreter. So these are really things where you realize that a judge makes truly a difference to the lives of to the lives of people. When you become a judge, the first thing that you come face to face with are your own fears. Because as lawyers, we can decide what cases to accept and what cases not to accept. Of course, occasionally judges can recuse, but you can't recuse every, every evening. As a lawyer can say that, well, I'm busy in a part heard before another bench. You have to take up everything which is dished out into your daily work under the roster prepared by the Chief Justice. And I was confronted with my own fears because I was predominantly a public lawyer, a public law lawyer. And then suddenly I was catapulted into a situation where my first sitting 
after 11 years as a judge on the division bench was to head the tax bench. I'd done a little bit of tax work when I was additional Solicitor General of India between 1998 and 2000. But there I was trying to confront my own fears. How am I going to handle a tax bench, learning how to head a division bench for the first time? Or to head the commercial court, to deal, we didn't have commercial courts, but these were what we called the motions court. I had no clue about how to deal with commercial work. But you, that's when you learn to be humble, because you learn the limits of your own knowledge as a judge, and how vast knowledge is, and you realize the importance of the bar in educating you. If we, if we just step back and allow a little bit more time to the member of the bar who's arguing before you, you realize the importance of being patient, because you realize the limits of your own knowledge and the enrichment which you receive as a judge by just allowing different people speak. It may appear to be utterly irrelevant, but in that irrelevance, sometimes you realize that there is some human story which is unfolding before you. As Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court, I learned a great deal from judges from the service judiciary, from the district judiciary who came to the High Court. You know, there is a divide in the High Courts between bar judges and service judges. The bar judges are always regarded as, you know, a cut above everybody else. They are, go on foreign holidays, which district judges who have come to the High Court cannot do. They have the kind of apparel which district judges do not wear. But I learned from my colleagues who are drawn from the district judiciary what a wealth of experience they had about the law actually in motion, because they had come face to face. They had come face to face with trial actions. They had an understanding about witnesses. They had understanding about what our society is about, because as you go, to the, you, as you go higher and higher, into the judiciary, you become separated from and isolated from the real strata of society for whom you are intended to do justice. <laughs>